Well, Stephen, thank you. I, uh, I appreciate those kind words. The, uh, I always wonder what people in Austin do on a Friday, and I just assume you're all out at the broken spoke or something. Uh, but you younger people, you can't do that sort of thing yet. Uh, you have bomb attacks in the morning, and then uh, you talk to people like me in the evening. Uh, it's really nice to be here, and Austin is a very special place. So for all uh, of us around the country that worry about sustainability and are working on various kind of things, there are lots of things that have happened here and started here. Uh, Dick Richardson, a longtime friend, uh, was on the faculty here for many years, was one of the founders of the sustainable agricultural movement way back when, before there was a, a movement. Uh, Plenty Fisk and Gail Vittori. Plenty, where are you? Plenty and Gail. Back here, uh, the Center for Maximum Potential Building Systems is one of the uh, leaders in rethinking design and the design of larger systems and the whole word of design. So uh, they've been pioneers in this uh, field, this space, for a long time. Now, a good bit that's happened here at the university is, has been out there on the, the front edge of design, and certainly the School of Architecture and Fritz Steiner and uh, Stephen Moore and, and people here. So th this has been one of the, the places where sustainability uh, has gotten traction, actually uh, doing lots of things. Uh, I want to thank Jay Banner uh, and uh, Jim Walker for uh, hosting me for the last uh, couple of days, getting me out of the hotel when the bomb threat, we had to evacuate the hotel and all that. And thanks to all of you for being here. You all know there was a bomb threat? Uh, uh, anyway, we, uh, we lived through it, and it all turned out real well. Um, I'm going to do two things tonight. This is Friday night, and I want to cut. I want to keep my remarks as short uh, as I possibly can. But I want to do two things. The first part is going to be depressing, so just fasten your seatbelt and hang on. Uh, but then you know all this stuff. Uh, but the second part is to understand what we do about it. That, that's the important part. So the bad news is an invitation to think about how we turn the coin over and create a different future from that which is in prospect. So this is a uh, kind of how to do it talk. Black Swan here on the, uh, the title uh, slide does not refer to uh, the movie. Uh, it refers to a book by a risk analyst by the name of Nassim Taleb. And uh, all swans are white until you have a black swan. And the black swan, the birth of a black swan, is kind of unpredictable. And black swan events in Taleb's frame are events that are high impact, uh, unpredictable or with unknown predictability, a different thing, and with, uh, in many times, global consequences. So black swan events, we live increasingly in a black swan world, so that's the, that's the focus. If you're into numbers and statistics, uh, this is kind of what it looks like. And I had a pointer here. Here we go. Is this it? Yes. So when you learn statistics, this is a bell-shaped or Gaussian curve. When you learn statistics, you worry about this stuff up here and the large number of events that occur under the, the top, the peak of the curve. The tail out here is, uh, are events of decreasing probability, and that's where the black swan events occur. It's the events that happen on that, what's called the long tail. Uh, the, the 20th century started out, you know, you know, you think God doesn't have a sense of humor. Uh, the Titanic was created so that Leo DiCaprio could meet, you know, what's her name? Uh, so it all started out great, uh, didn't end up so great. This is a black swan event, not predictable by any, this is supposed to be an unsinkable ship. They just didn't count on hitting icebergs at high speed and so forth. It was a great opportunity for Leo DiCaprio. Uh, but anyway, black swan event. Uh, this was uh, the safest bridge, or this bridge was thought to be safe. Uh, it was inspected a month or so before until it wasn't safe, black swan event. This was thought to be the safest uh, oil platform uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, and of course, uh, this was safe until it wasn't. That was a BP spill two years ago. Uh, Yasi, uh, the largest hurricane or largest cyclonic event to hit Australia, kind of a black swan event. These are not all physical events. These are sometimes and in, in often are social events or the interaction of social events with uh, natural uh, systems. And so you have two uh, kinds of systems of high unpredictability, all those things that we create in the world, corporations and governments and societies and so forth. Then over here, ecosystems and agricultural systems and climate systems and so forth. So this is the uh, food prices. And as food prices go up for lots of reasons, it triggered the Arab Spring black swan event. Not easily predictable. You had to know a whole lot of stuff to arrive at the conclusion that that would happen. 
Fukushima uh, Black Swan event. And this is a uh, Richter 9 event uh, combined with GE equipment, some really bad planning, and probably a fair amount of corruption. And the rest, as they say, is history. And we know Fukushima is one of the worst disasters of all time. Uh, 1999, Time Magazine selected these three guys as the committee to save the world. And, uh, you know, that ought to elicit laughter. They did a heck of a job, didn't they? Uh, and this, uh, the, the front uh, figure here is Alan Greenspan, an Ayn Rand uh, fan, as is Paul Ryan. And uh, Alan Greenspan discovered, this is October 23rd, 2008, discovered a flaw in his thinking. And uh, note this in your calendar. This was, this was quite, uh, quite an event, black swan event. And what occurred was he, he didn't realize that uh, foxes left to guard the hen house generally ate the hens. And uh, so th this is a black swan event, the, the collapse of the banks in 2008. And uh, uh, the rest, as they say, is kind of history. We've been digging out of that hole for a while. But uh, black swan events are not all technological and collapsing bridges and so forth. This is Detroit. You didn't have to be uh, real smart to see that we had a problem with the economy. You just had to come to places where uh, I grew up near Youngstown, Ohio, and that's in a, basically an abandoned and gutted old mill town that I remember as a very prosperous, corrupt but prosperous uh, town uh, as a kid uh, growing up in western Pennsylvania. Uh, so black swan events are sometimes urban events. But to understand what was going on with this, you didn't have to know a whole lot except that we were trying to calibrate the laws of economics that begin with, say, Adam Smith's uh, publication of Wealth of Nations in 1776, trying to calibrate those laws that we take are immutable uh, of economics with the way the world works as a physical system. And those laws are 3.8 billion years old. You've got a problem. Miscalibration. But there are lots of other problems with the economy. You can read the slide. I'm not going to repeat what's on the screen. But uh, we, we had lots of flaws in that system. So some black swan events are uh, triggered because we just don't think well enough about complicated things that in some ways are, are actually fairly simple. So we're running two deficits. Uh, one is a financial deficit, uh, which we'll sort of figure out somehow, maybe, perhaps, the other is not so easy to solve. It's a deficit to natural systems. Once species go extinct, as all of you know, they're, they're gone. Uh, there's no bringing them back uh, by any method that we, we currently uh, we consider to be feasible. Uh, carbon in the atmosphere tends to stay there a long time. And so there are two different kinds of deficits running. We tend to worry in election year or told we ought to worry only about the financial deficit. That's the easier one. The other one is much more serious, and that's not getting adequate coverage in this, uh, this campaign. I wish Gary Larson would come back to cartooning. I miss Gary Larson. And uh, can all of you see that in the back? Can you see that? Okay. Uh, object in the mirror is closer than uh, it appears. Of course, she's looking at a bloodshot eyeball. Uh, let's stop and, and do some curve recognition. How many recognize that curve? Does anybody not recognize the Coca-Cola curve? Uh, whoops. Uh, all right. The second curve is that one. Uh, anybody not recognize that? How many of you ate at McDonald's today? You just won't admit it. Uh, how many recognize the Nike swoosh? How many are wearing Nike equipment right now? A couple of hands timidly went up. All right. And then how many recognize that curve? Now, I said once uh, a year or two back, I said once, you know, one of these can kill you. And somebody in the audience yelled out, no, 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 three can kill you. <laughs> so uh, this, of course, is a Keeling curve, and this is named after David Keeling. Uh, as of this morning on the uh, Internet, we're now at about 394 parts per million carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But David Keeling, and that's the, actually the next slide, David Keeling went to Mauna Loa in uh, 1958 and began to measure carbon in the atmosphere. And in 1958, it was about 315 parts per million, so that's the, the far end of that curve. We're now up here at 394. Somebody measured uh, 400 parts per million over Antarctica, or probably over the Arctic uh, this past winter. Uh, but if you extend that curve back that way, uh, about 640,000 years, give or take, it never goes above 290 parts per million. And if you extend it back another, you loosen the standards of evidence just a wee bit, you can extend it back uh, a long, long way, and it stays at 280 
parts per million, 290 parts per million or so. The point of this is we are where we've never been before. And so we're in terra incognita. We've never been here before. Humans have not been on this planet when we've had that much carbon in the atmosphere. And I want to come back and explain what I think that means. One of the problems of that is this. The abnormal weather that you've seen here in Texas, we've seen different kinds of it in Ohio. It's seen all around the world. Hottest hots, wettest wets, driest dry conditions, windiest wind conditions. To the extent that they're climate related, they're caused by what came out of our tailpipes and smokestacks 30 years ago. It has nothing to do with 394 parts per million. That was caused by things up here that are happening currently, wildfires in the west, uh, heat waves, uh, bigger storms, rising seas, and so forth. That's not caused by what we now are currently doing. It's what we did 30 years ago. And the reason, of course, is the oceans act as a big thermal anchor. And as the oceans warm and acidify, as uh, many of you know, that 30-year uh, margin shrinks to 20 years. Now, uh, this is the problem. We're now committed to events that will be caused by uh, global warming conditions at 394 parts per million. And this, of course, is rising at the rate uh, this last year at about 1.5 parts per million. That was down a bit. The year before, it was up at about 2.2 parts per million. So this hits us where we're weakest. This is a lag effect. We tend to be kind of short-term creatures. Uh, we're really good at something that uh, hits us right now and the immediate crisis of the crisis du jour. We were great in the bomb scare this morning. That was great. And if we'd found somebody who put the bomb there, we would have dealt with them. Believe me, we would have dealt with them. I'm a high, I'm more passive. We've got a lot of Amish people there. You're better armed down here. But, you know, we, we, <laughs> we deal with things like this. Uh, now, this is kind of where we're headed. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but we're probably headed for about 2 uh, degrees centigrade warming. We'll be real lucky to avoid that. And most scientists believe that 2 degrees centigrade warming uh, is a kind of point of no return. It is not to say that everything on this side of 2 degrees centigrade warming is safe. It is to say everything on that side of it is really unsafe. But we don't know where safety is in this case. We just don't know. Uh, somebody once said a long time ago, we're running a one-time experiment with the planet. Uh, it's not the kind of experiment you and I really, really want to run, but we're running it. And it's been decided for us that we're going to continue to run it. Somewhere along this line, civilization comes undone unless we craft a different future. And that's not particularly controversial among people who study climate for a living and have to live by the rigors of peer review, fact, logic, and data, or they don't eat. You follow me? So we've got a climate debate going on here, but among the scientific community, 98% are more or less uh, in agreement that we've got a problem. And the science here, of course, is very simple, in a way. You put heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere, you'll trap heat. And if you put a whole lot of them there, you'll trap a whole lot of heat. And the science is, is fairly uh, rather reminiscent of having a car parked on an Austin parking lot, black asphalt, on a summer day when the outside temperature is 95 and you've got the windows rolled up. And so uh, the car takes in shortwave radiation like the planet does, but it doesn't allow longwave radiation to escape. And so the temperature of the car goes up 130, 140 degrees, and you can fry little kids and, and dogs in that car. And that's a little bit like, uh, like climate change. So somewhere along this vertical line here, things do start to unravel. Now, we've worked with a theory that we, we assume you can turn the thermostat of the planet up a little bit and nothing else over here wobbles. But that's not the black swan world. That's a world where small changes have big effects. That's the world we're moving into. It's that long tail on that Gaussian curve. All of a sudden, things start coming undone. In Ohio, uh, we've got something called the emerald ash borer. It's a little bug, and it bores into ash trees. I live in oak hickory ash, or what had been an oak hickory ash forest. Uh, a month and a half ago, I had to have my large ash tree, big ash tree that would be twice the width of this podium, cut down because of the emerald ash borer. And the guys that came and cut it down said, yeah, because the winters are warmer now, these little insects can overwinter, and other insects are coming after the oaks, and the hickories. So we lose our hardwoods, and that's because of warming. Uh, so things shift, and they begin to shift to the right. So this long tail begins to shift out here in directions we don't really like. Now, the probabilities here are often, it isn't that they're necessarily low probabilities, it's that they're unknown probabilities. That's the black swan kind of world. Uh, this is the uh, Russian heat wave in the summer of 2010, and that occurs on that, uh, that slide out here. Uh, 
totally improbable event. 95% likely that this is caused by global warming, but this is a totally improbable event. And you go down a lot of climate uh, anomalies, hottest hots, wettest wet, driest driest, windiest wind conditions, and that's the same kind of thing. Now, here's the other part of the problem. Once carbon is in the atmosphere, it tends to stay there a long time. Now, this poses for us as Americans, I think, a particularly unique kind of problem. This is David Archer, and David Archer is a geophysicist at the University of Chicago. And this quote is taken in the, the opening paragraph of his book called The Long Thaw. And Archer says, the climate, climatic impacts of releasing fossil fuel CO2 to the atmosphere will last longer than Stonehenge, longer than time capsules, longer than nuclear waste, far longer than the age of human civilization so far. Each ton of coal that we burn, or oil, or natural gas, leaves CO2 gas in the atmosphere. The CO2 coming from a quarter of that ton will still be affecting the climate 1,000 years from now. Part of it will be there 100,000 years from now, I'm told. Now, you take a deep breath. Americans are, we like optimism. We're people that solve problems. And if you've got a Chevy or a Ford with a broken carburetor, that's fixable. That's solvable. This isn't. This is a problem for us. Psychologically, this is hard for us as Americans to reckon with. This hits us where we are weakest. We think of ourselves as problem solvers, but we're responsible as Americans for putting about 28% of the historic carbon in the atmosphere that will hang around for a long time. Now, we're not used to thinking about 1,000-year you know, planning horizons. We're pretty good if we get to the end of the month. And in politics, we, you know, we think in terms of maybe you know, uh, Mitt Romney and uh, Barack Obama are talking about maybe four-year plans or something. Uh, in business, you think maybe a little bit longer, some think a little bit shorter, but we're well under a decade, 1,000-year planning. And you'd be hard-pressed to think of any organization, human-made organization, uh, that's lasted for 1,000 years, Roman Catholic Church and, you know, a few other things like that. Now, here's what climate change is not. This isn't global warming. This is planetary destabilization. Turn the thermostat up, and lots of other things begin to wobble. So global warming, there are days in Ohio, I will confess, when global warming sounds good. Uh, but this is planetary destabilization. This affects food, politics, economics, everything else starts to come undone. And the causal, we're not really good at, at understanding complex causal chains, but that's what we're getting into. This isn't a matter of belief, it's physics and chemistry. Now, uh, people say, and I hear this all the time, Do you, I, I just don't believe in climate change. Now look. If you say you don't believe in Moses or Jesus or Buddha, that's belief. Climate change is physics and chemistry. And no one comes up to you and says, I just don't believe in the laws of gravity. And if they do, there's a simple and fairly definite test for that. Come to the top of the building. Let's check it out. Uh, you go first. Uh, this is not a matter of belief. It's a matter of physics and chemistry. And uh, the atmospheric, atmospheric physics don't give a damn what you and I believe. It's just going to work. There's a kind of remorseless working out of big numbers. Load the atmosphere with heat-trapping gases, it'll trap heat. That's what it's designed to do. Third, this isn't an isolated problem. This isn't something that we can separate from virtually anything else that ails us. This is embedded in the way we live, the way we think, the way we organize things. Now, that's not a depressing sort of thing, because, because it's not an isolated issue. If we solve in some way the problem, not of climate change, because that's in some ways not solvable now, but if we solve the problem of how to power this economy and this world by sunshine and efficiency and human ingenuity, then that's going to be a pretty good thing. That then solves lots of other problems. That solves economic problems. That begins to create employment. It reduces pollution, balance of payments, deficits, and all kinds of other things. Fourth, this really isn't controversial. Uh, I just came back from India uh, about a month ago, and uh, it's not controversial in India. It's not controversial in China. It's not really controversial much in Europe. But it's controversial here. And the reason is why. Uh, if you're an attorney, you know the reason. The old attorney's rule, follow the money. Well, selling fossil fuels is a two to three trillion dollar a year business. And if you're in it, you know, you want to sell as much as you can. The problem for us is that there's something like 20 trillion dollars or maybe 25 trillion dollars embedded in the ground that we can't burn. If you burn it, we're going to fry the planet. So you can keep the party going for a while longer, but at the cost of frying the planet. 
So the, the reason here for denial and for a lot of people's just skepticism is uh, not hard to figure out. All you have to know is that people can be greedy and they can be short-sighted and there's a lot of money here and then uh, that's pretty simple. And then the question is, well, that people will say, and I've got family members who say, well, look, David, we believe all that, but uh, climate change, climate's always been changing. And so isn't this just part of the natural cycle? Well, it's yes and it's no. Climate does change. But if it's in a cooling trend, we're dampening the cooling. If it's in a warming trend, we're accelerating the cooling. And so carbon dioxide is that little thermostat in the planet. And yeah, the Milankovitch cycles and all these other things do kick in. The Earth is a complicated system. Earth system science has lots of different variables. But the fact is that carbon dioxide in large amounts will drive climate in very different directions. Now, I want to stop there just for a second. Now, here, here's part of the difficulty. Uh, has anybody in this room got sweaty palms because of what I've just finished saying? Hold up your hand. Put them down. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to say no. Uh, anybody get an increased heart rate? Well, a few of you. All right. All right. So there are a few of you that got the message. Here's the difficulty. You're not a cooperative audience here. This is Friday night. You're supposed to. Uh, here's the difficulty. Climate change, none of this stuff. This is just pixels on a screen. And we're wired to look at this and say, well, you know, that slide, that blue slide with the yellow line going up, that's kind of pretty, but, you know, if you use a little different shade of color and so forth, we're not wired to see this as a threat. That's not how we got where we got. Now, uh, we are wired. If I reach down here, and I've said this to audiences all over the country, if I reach down here and I pull out a, uh, you know, sawed-off shotgun and I kind of casually walk out towards you, I've got your attention. All of a sudden, your fight-flight mechanism kicks in. And you're saying, uh, hey, this dude from Ohio, he's pretty cool, but I'm out of here. Uh, or you're thinking, let's rush him and beat the hell out of him uh, and be done with this talk and get out, get on the Friday night here in Austin, Texas. Uh, we were hardwired by evolution to be really good with dependably loathsome threats. If it's got long, nasty teeth and it growls and so forth, we're good. We're really good. If it's like Adolf Hitler or Osama bin Laden, we're real good. If we've got in a dependably loathsome enemy, we're good. Parts per billion, parts per million, thousand years, doesn't do it. It doesn't hit us where we live. We understand this more than we feel it. And we won't do much until we feel it. Okay, you all with me? We have a problem. Nature played or evolution played a trick on us. And if you don't believe in evolution, then that's another problem. But uh, the... Uh, uh, the difficulty is we're not wired to respond to threats measured in parts per billion. We're responded to, we respond well to, to direct physical threats. All right, now let's get on the other side. That's all the bad news, okay? Uh, here's the other side of the coin. I made a mistake about a year and a half ago of, uh, this is my town of Oberlin, Ohio. And I said, uh, without smiling, I said that we, uh, we got this picture by attaching a first-year student, a freshman at uh, Oberlin, uh, to a helium-filled balloon <laughs> with a camera with electronic download. And I said, Bob is a really nice kid. Uh, we miss him. He said uh, <laughs> he, didn't, uh, he didn't transfer out of Oberlin. He just kind of drifted away. <laughs> woman came up to me afterwards and said, she thought I was serious, and she said, you know, you really shouldn't treat your students like that. <laughs> uh, and they'll get high in their own ways, in different ways. That's a whole other thing. Uh, this is, uh, so I did. This is actually taken with a, you know, just a remote camera on a balloon. No student was attached to it. Uh, this is over in Ohio, and this is... Uh, Little town, we're, uh, we were started in 1832. Uh, this was the first college to accept African Americans and women uh, in the United States. Uh, we're about 10,000. Uh, we're in, as you'll see in a subsequent slide, we're in the uh, Rust Belt area. Uh, Detroit's about 84 miles away, Cleveland's 34 miles away. We're in the old Rust Belt where a lot of disinvestment occurred. We started investing in Texas and California and Arizona, and we took money out of Ohio, so we're still mad about that. Um, this is a, uh, a the downtown corridor here. Uh, we have a 28% uh, level of poverty. Uh, it's actually dropped in the last census to 23%. But that's Oberlin, Ohio. And that's where we are. Uh, we are Rust Belt. And, but we have water. And uh, still somewhat temperate climate. Very typical downtown. 
Uh, that is a part of the downtown. This is the Apollo Theater that's just been uh, remodeled. That's on the National Historic Registry. Uh, you go to the Apollo Theater and you could see first run films. We were up to Gone with the Wind. Um, uh, great little downtown. That's the back end of my Prius right there. Uh, now, I want to say what the question for me was what do I do personally about climate change? I've got four grandkids. And what kind of world am I leaving for those kids? And so for me, the issue is what do I do in the place in which I live? And so, uh, what, this is the Adam Joseph Lewis Center that was referred to a moment ago. In 1995, we began a project with uh, about 250 students came along. We wanted to build a building that would house the environmental studies program. And uh, it became my project for lots of reasons. And so one of the things I did was say, okay, if you want to be part of designing a building, an academic building, come on in. And I was told you'll never, they'll, they'll, they'll design it, it'll be a bad building. Kids can't design buildings. Uh, about 250 came in. We had 13 public design charrettes or design meetings. Uh, and uh, we put together a design team that included some of the best architects and designers and so forth around. Uh, Plenty of Fist came up in one of the pre-sessions a year or so before and helped us think about the, the nature of design and so forth. But we, we put together a design team with about uh, two, these 250 kids or 300 or so uh, and began to work on this. And they said they wanted a building powered by sunshine. Well, we're in Ohio. You've got sunshine down here. We have two sunny days in Oberlin, Ohio, every year. Uh, and, uh, but they wanted a building powered by sunshine. They wanted a building that was zero discharge, drinking water in, drinking water out. Well, uh, the standard way to do that would be to put the toilets in another building. And uh, we had to figure out how to, how to solve that problem. But this is what came out of the, the effort. Uh, and that building was uh, built in the year 2000. Uh, it is still, I believe, the only entirely solar-powered building on a U.S. college campus. Uh, it is a zero discharge building. The right hand side here is a, a John Todd design living machine. Uh, so you flush the toilet and the wastewater comes into what is basically an indoor uh, wetland. It works fine. It's been there uh, working well for uh, uh, 12 years now. Uh, no toxic materials and so forth. This was a lead uh, U.S. Green Building Council lead rating system, platinum building before there was a rating system. Uh, this became the template for a larger uh, project, the Oberlin project that Stephen described. And what we said in this, can we take that model and scale that up in many ways, uh, the same thing you're doing here with the Austin Green Building Program and, and other things happening here, but can you scale this up to an eight-mile radius? And so if you put a compass down on our square or in front of this building and draw a circle with a, a uh, radius about eight miles, that's what we're aiming to do. This is an aerial view of that same building. This is the wetland and pond here. Photovoltaic array on the roof, another one over parking deck. This is south, east, west, north. And so this became a model for what we were doing with sustainability. Now, here's one of the problems we had. For you kids in high school uh, and college, all this stuff about sustainability floats up here as an abstraction. That's a word no one really knows what that word means. And if you do, you don't really know. It's one of those things if you say you know, you just don't know. <clears throat> reminded of the story of a little girl uh, who's drawing a picture. Her mother came over and asked her, honey, what are, you, uh, what are you drawing? And the little girl said to her mother, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the uh, uh, mother looked at her and says, well, honey, nobody really knows what God looks like. And she turned and looked at her mother and said, well, they will now. <laughs> uh, now, sustainability is the same thing. The goal is can we begin to create models that we can see and touch and feel and experience. And so the idea we did here on very in a microcosm was say, okay, let's take a model of sustainability and let's build it. So when, when Thoreau went to Walden, he said, I went to Walden to drive some of the problems of living into a corner where I could study them. That's what we did here. And so in this site, there's solar energy, there's high performance building monitoring. The back here is essentially a farm and, and gardens that are managed and maintained by students. This is a, a wetland area that's basically a restoration of the, the ecosystem that had been in that site before European settlement. This building beside us was also part of the design project, but we collapsed a lot of the issues of sustainability into an acre and a quarter site. Downscale those issues to the size of a building. This is only 13,700 square foot building. 
get them to the size that the human mind can get around, do the kind of things that uh, Max Potts doing and many of you are involved in, but let's get sustainability down to a size that we can comprehend. So that was the goal here. Now the question is, can we take what happened in that building and scale that up to the size of a small town? That's the back of the building. This is an orchard uh, maintained by students. Off to the right is a garden area. Uh, this is Bill McKibben giving a... Uh, uh, Earth Day lecture last spring in the middle of a driving rainstorm. This is a six inch rain coming down outside. Uh, I didn't realize how much impact uh, this building had had uh, until the following events I'll describe. This is a picture I took of the rooftop photovoltaic array. This is a 60 kW array on the roof. And I waited for the sun to get just right, and I didn't realize how much impact we had had until I was in England and saw this. Uh, this is Harvey's beer. And you'll notice that Harvey's beer took my picture and put it on its label. And they didn't ask me about it. So my people are talking to their people. The settlement we're asking for is a case of Harvey's beer delivered to my residence every week. Uh, this, uh, the Open Project has four goals. The first is economic development. We want to take a 13-acre block right in the middle of downtown. You'll see in just a moment. Uh, and make that a driver in the local economy. Power it by sunshine, make it zero discharge, but do everything we did in the Lewis Center, but make that a driver in the local economy. Do what the U.S. Green Building Council describes as neighborhood development at the uh, platinum level, but also make this an economic driver. So that becomes a buyer of and engaged in the local economy. The way it's developed, the way it's fleshed out, the way it's maintained uh, becomes the driver. Secondly, uh, we're one of 17 uh, Clinton climate initiatives around the, uh, uh, the world. We're obviously the small kid on the block. Uh, the rest of them are uh, million, tens of millions of people. There are three Clinton climate cities in the United States, San Francisco, Chicago, and uh, over on Ohio. We're obviously the small kid. The goal here is to get to carbon neutrality. Can we, not just as a college, but as a college and a community in that eight-mile radius, can we get to carbon neutrality? So can we eliminate carbon emissions, build a new energy economy, powered by sunshine, be prosperous and well-powered? Third goal is to create a green belt around the city. Ohio used to be a, uh, a farm state. We had at one point uh, maybe 250,000 farms. We're now down to about 60,000 farms, give or take, mostly in the corn and soybean business. So can we begin to create a local farm economy again, local foods, and can that be done to the extent of supplying 70% of the food consumed locally? And that's about an $18 million market in our case. Now, we're not going to import food from California, and you won't either, at a price you could afford, at a volume you've got to have to feed your population in another decade, or is it two decades or three decades, but let global warming go far enough, we won't be getting food from California. We'll have to relearn the arts of local agriculture. And then can we do the whole thing in a way that we did the Lewis Center? Do we make this an educational project? An education here, not small e, but capital E. Can we get people engaged in education, involved in this? So we put together a consortium of the local public school, uh, a joint vocational school, a uh, two-year college, and then Oberlin College. And the question here is, what do you young people need to know to live a decent, productive life and to write your uh, autobiography on the topography of this time in a way you're really proud of? How do you understand this issue, uh, these issues, and develop the skill set, the analytic abilities, the character, and so forth, to be relevant to these kinds of issues? And then fourth or fifth, we want to figure out how to replicate this everywhere. We want to join with other efforts to make this a national movement, kind of our version of a Tea Party movement, except powered by sunshine, and get people engaged, all the anger and the angst that's out there in the American public. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've got it here in Austin. We've got it in Ohio. It's all over the country. Lots of people feel very frustrated. Some reasons are good. Some are not so good. But can we begin to channel that as we re-solarize and rebuild local economies and do this sustainably? and fairly and decently. A lot of what you're doing already here in, in uh, Austin, Texas. Now, this is how we've organized the community. Actually, we've got 11 teams. Uh, I couldn't figure out how to get 11 balls on that slide, though, so you'll just have to live with uh, seven there. Uh, this is, we, we've organized the community around this concept of, for lack of a better phrase, full-spectrum sustainability. Now, those of you that have been in the environmental movement for a while know that we've done this it's a series of kind of one-off things. We did sustainable ag and, and sustainable forestry and then green building and renewable energy systems, education. We've never, ever tried, as far as I can tell, to put all these together into a system where the parts reinforce the whole thing. 
It's called systems thinking. Now, if you press me really hard and you say, how are you doing that? I don't know. I'm working beyond my pay grade. But I know it can be done. We've been at this for three years. It is so far working. It just means you've got to take systems into public administration, systems thinking into economics, systems thinking into education. And that's the core of a good environmental education, begin to think of how things link together. And then if you, if you happen to be religious, and I expect most of you are in some way or other, uh, the, word, the root for the word religion means to bind together. And so if you can see a religious impulse. But how, how do we create holes where there was once fragmentation and wholeness where there was once animosity? How do we begin to pull these things together? So for lack of a better phrase, full spectrum sustainability. And it's a journey. I, I have no formula for it. But it means uh, you're going to have lunch with lots of different kinds of people and different kinds of conversations as you begin to engage different subjects. Uh, let me give one example. We want to rebuild a, a hotel, uh, build a new hotel in the downtown. And I want the hotel restaurant to be at the four-star level, provisioned with local farm goods. I want that to be an outlet for local farmers. We think the hotel budget, food budget would be around one to one and a half million dollars a year. But to get a supply chain out there in that green belt, I've got to have at the table educators who will begin to educate young people differently so they know how to farm, they know how to grow food, how to raise animals and so forth. That's not where the educational system is headed. I need kids who know practically how to do things, how to grow things. And then I need uh, the economic development team at the table because if you want to go into agriculture, you're not going to agriculture because it's expensive. In our part of the world, a small farm starts at about a half a million dollars and works up real quick. An average size farm, you better have something over a million dollars. It's expensive. So I've got to have somebody there who understands something about finance. I've got to have the bankers there and so forth. How do you work out the payment? Uh, then I've got to have somebody there who understands economic development because we need the market. I need that market guarantee. And then I've got to have social people there because you can't farm alone. You've got to have a, you've got to have a farm community. And so it's not one-off farmers. You've got to have a network of farmers. I need a buddy system with old farmers and young farmers and so forth. You follow what I'm saying? Full-spectrum sustainability it means you're going to have to do one fairly simple-sounding thing. You've got to have a lot of people there to make that thing work. And that's not how we do things, but we've got to relearn it. That's once, I think, how we did it. And if you do happen to be religious about this, and I expect most of you are, uh, I think I am, this is a religious mandate. Uh, it's not an accident that uh, you know, words like whole and holy and healing and health, they're, they're related more than just etymologically. Those are kin because that's, that's part of that impulse in all of us for this kind of transcendence and wholeness. Now, how do we do this? This is a, any questions on this slide? <laughs> hey, uh, Google Danella Meadows. Uh, she, uh, uh, Dana Meadows is a good friend of mine. She died 10 or 11 years ago. Uh, but before she died, she, she wrote a, a series of wonderful things, one of which was an article called Places to Intervene in the System. Now, for you young people, it's a whole lot easier to be right about an issue than it is to be right and effective. And to be effective and right, you, to be right, you've got to understand a lot of things. You've got to read the science, and you, you've got to take the right classes and so forth. To be effective, you have to know where you intervene in the system, where it's called the school or the neighborhood, or the PTA, or the Boy Scouts, or Girl Scouts, whatever it is, whatever system in which you live, you want to change. So what Dana Meadows did in this article, she started up here at the top with all the things that are ineffective, and there are subsidies, codes, standards, and so forth. If you want to change the system, you've got to get down here. You've got to change worldviews. Now, Google Dana Meadows, leverage points, and you'll, you'll get the article. You can read it. It's a great article, and so forth. So your reading assignment, first item on your reading assignment is Dana Meadows, uh, leverage points. Now, this is smart stuff. We gave this out to all the people in our... Uh, our community group. So we passed out about 100 copies of this to the people, the first uh, people that had gotten involved in the Oberlin project. And we're trying to understand how we move this little city of Oberlin and how we move uh, the college so that we create a culture of sustainability. That doing the right thing is the easy thing to do. That's the default setting. And doing something with carbon fuels and doing it wastefully and non-ecologically, that's the hard thing to do. Do you follow what I'm saying? This has to happen all the way through the country. So we've got to begin to ask these kinds of questions that Dana read. Now, let me say something else. Uh, this, is, this is going to sound like an advertisement for Oberlin, and maybe, maybe it is. Uh, upper left-hand corner is the Cass Gilbert Building. That's one of the very famous art museums in higher education. That's on the one corner of this Green Arts District, and you'll see that in just a moment. Uh, there's a jazz building. This is the only lead-rated jazz building in the world. Somebody pointed out to me it's probably the only jazz building in the world. 
Uh, that's a science building, uh, not one I'm terribly proud of. This is a performing arts center. Now, here's the point of this. Uh, people like me and some of you out there, when we get into the subject, we're really boring. Yeah, I know. It's a, that's, <laughs> that's a surprise to you. We are, we're wonky. And we talk about science. We talk about parts per billion. And we talk in a great length about policy issues and science issues. That doesn't hit most of us where we live. We need a bigger conversation. And one that takes in the arts and music and culture and foods, we need a celebration. We need this the sustainability movement needs to be one big party. It needs to be powered by sunshine and local foods. Do you follow what I'm saying? This needs to hit all of us, not just the one half of the brain that's analytical, the other half that's creative and uh, supposed to be the feminine side of the brain, whatever it is, but it's creative, it's ironic, it's fun, it's humorous. That's the playful side. That's where the arts come from. That's poetry and that's music and so forth. We need a conversation about the human future that takes in all of those things. And in, in Oberlin, uh, we've got uh, great conservatory music, a great art program. We have a great drama program. I want those things as part of a larger conversation about sustainability. So it's not all this wonky, boring science stuff. That's important. But it won't move us very far unless we are moved by art and science and poetry and music and so forth. This is the Green Arts Block, 13-acre uh, block. This is the town square over here. Uh, this is the Allen Art Museum. This is a very famous art museum that I mentioned. Performing Arts Center here. This is a hotel built in uh, 1955. It's an old motor inn. Uh, this is the driver for the Oberlin Project. Now, it would be different in Austin. It would be different in Los Angeles. It would be different in lots of other places. But we needed in a small town an anchor institution that would do something that drives the economy in a very different direction. You run the film fast forward for us, and the gravity mass of the Rust Belt economy will take us down. There's no happy future unless we make a very different future. Uh, this is the Oberlin Inn. My boss, the college president, uh, told me never to say that this was a plausible excuse for a limited nuclear war again. So I don't say that anymore. Uh, this is built in 1955. The, uh, when we studied this particular building, the R factor of the walls was an R of four. If you know architecture, our phone book, little tiny phone book, has an R factor of four. Uh, this thing needed to go. So we're going to build a new hotel. And that's my uh, day job right now is to raise uh, the final money for a hotel. This is what the block will look like on completion at build-out. There will be student housing and some other housing back here. This is a PV array of our parking lot. This is commercial space and hotel space here. This is a conference facility and some office space. These are two new theaters flanking the Performing Arts Center here. This is, of course, the Art Museum. These two are historic houses, and they, they would stay. Uh, so that's what the block looks like. This is what the hotel uh, schematics look like. So you can stand on this corner and look through a four-story atrium looking back into park space. Um, our design team consists of a, a Chicago architectural firm, uh, the Getty Interior Design Firm in uh, Los Angeles, and a German engineering firm. That's looking the other way, looking to the south. And so this is a courtyard right outside the, uh, on the north face of the building. And that's kind of street level, what it would look like. This faces, this side faces out to uh, the square. This side down here, this is commercial space here. And then hotel rooms up here. Uh, and this isn't uh, uh, build it and they will come. They already arrive at Oberlin because of music and art and drama and so forth. We're 35 minutes from an airport. You all invited to come, stay in a new hotel. Uh, it's, they're already coming, but they've not uh, got a good place to stay. And so this is one of the drivers for us. Uh, interior shots, these are, again, schematic drawings of uh, what we think we can build. This is on the other side of the street. If you turn the Apollo Theater, which I showed you has been renovated up here, this is a project I'm really proud of. This was three students who, uh, in the parlance of those of you in higher education, the, the students who stayed in town, uh, and academics call it the failing to launch. And so they, they liked Oberlin. They stayed. They started a development company. This is a $17 million project. It's mixed housing, 33 condominiums up here, which have sold uh, commercial space here on first uh, floor, which has been incredibly successful. This is the new urbanist model, beginning to flesh out space in downtowns, uh, take the open space and begin to flesh that out and pull people back into a more uh, coherent fabric of urban life. A um, couple things on energy, and then I want to get to the end of the talk here. This is Sherrod Brown. Uh, in the U.S. Senate. Sherrod, by the way, has been targeted by Carl Rove, another Texan. 
uh, this is Karl Rove's number one target, and he's put $13 million into Ohio politics to defeat Sherrod Brown. That's just a little fact. Uh, that's the PV array at the Lewis Center. Right after Sherrod, uh, I took this picture, Sherrod said, where'd you get that array? And at the time we got that array, uh, our choices were Germany or Japan. Our choice now would be number one, China. And uh, the irony was not lost on him that the, uh, the photovoltaic revolution began at the NASA space headquarters 24 miles from where he's standing. The largest solar manufacturer in the United States at that time was about 40 miles to the west. And we had to buy this from either Germany or Japan. That is no way to run an economy in sustainability. We've got to pull jobs back in here. We developed this technology. We've got to, I'm, I'm glad that the Chinese are doing what they're doing. This is not an anti-Chinese, but we need to lead on this. This was our technology. We need to develop it. This is American jobs, and we're letting this go away because we're not doing the kind of things that ought to be done to support that technology. So one of the things we're doing, this is a picture I took uh, the day before I came down here. This is a, a solar field, 11-acre solar field that is going in just on the north side of town. Uh, those are the guys getting ready. This is going to be a tracking system, so each of these uh, pylons uh, will have a solar collector mounted on it, and it will track the sun across the sky and then reset. So this is about a three megawatt uh, output solar array. Uh, this is one of the first farms that we started about uh, 12 years ago. This is a 70-acre, 78-acre farm. Uh, we're going to build 35 farms or develop working relationships with 35 farmers to supply, we believe, about 70% of our food supply to re-regionalize uh, the food market. I don't want to get into this, but there's a development corridor that runs through our town. This is about, uh, give or take, a build out 200 to 300 million dollars of development. Uh, we're about 60 million into that development phase. And so uh, everything in black has been done. Everything in red is still yet to be done. Uh, but this is a largely sustainable economic development. We've got to understand how you build economies that make the world work differently, powered by sunshine, efficiency, and so forth. Here's what we've done to date. We are a city college partnership. We're one of 16, now 17, Clinton climate positive cities. Our energy supply in Oberlin will be 90, actually it's more than 90, it'll be about 96% carbon free by next year. And so we've, we've made uh, significant progress. You've got an office and a staff uh, and so forth. This is what we've, uh, the bottom number here is actually now about $60 million. So we are, uh, we're moving. These are goals for the next year. Uh, we have lots more in each of the different areas, but these are the, the big goals. This is a community college partnership, an anchor institution working with the local community uh, in the same way as many of you, many of the projects here are, are working. So what is this? I'm going to close with some thoughts. If I take a beam of light and direct it through a crystal, it refracts in lots of different ways. And so for young people, all of you high school students are going to apply to Oberlin and, and want to come to Oberlin. This will be a really cool downtown. This will be a 24-7 downtown. Things are happening. Uh, there's music. There's culture. There are restaurants. There are places to go to be entertained. It's a really cool downtown. So you're all invited to apply. And I've got applications in my briefcase. Uh, for faculty, it's better facilities. Uh, when you bring people here, they, they stay at a, a, a good hotel. There are good uh, restaurants and so forth. It, it's no longer a bedraggled little downtown. For business people, it's more business. We think we can double or triple the volume of business in Main Street and the local economy. For Sherrod Brown, the Senate, uh, our Senator and Marcy Kaptur, until recently our, uh, our congressional representative, this is a model of economic development in the Rust Belt. We can build economies in the Rust Belt. We're not fated to just uh, have these cities uh, die. They can, they can, they're, they're dropping like this, but they can come back. They've got water, they've got talent, there's still energy, there's still ideas. For Bill Clinton, it was climate action. Uh, we believe that uh, we can get to climate positive condition, making more energy than we're using out of renewable energy sources. And we believe we can do that by 2025 to 2030. Uh, for me as an educator, everything I look at is an educational opportunity. This is a terrific opportunity, like with the Lewis Center to engage my students with some of the most creative designers and educators and uh, architects and developers uh, I know. And so they learn how to roll up their sleeves and solve problems, also begin to develop a, a great Rolodex on their own. But they learn that the world is still rich in possibilities. We're not fated to suffer the heat death of the planet. For uh, designers and for our design team, this is the first model, I believe, in full spectrum ecological design. How do we put these pieces together? So this is an experiment. And then a couple of years ago, ran into some people at the Pentagon, and they looked at the, what we're doing and said, oh, it's all about national security. 
And uh, it's one of those kind of moments where you slap your forehead and go, duh. I did my Ph.D. work in national security affairs a long time ago. I never thought of this as national security. But here's the point. We're used to thinking national security is starting at shores and borders and working out. That's deploying force in Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth. They're increasingly aware that national security, our security as a people, starts at our shores and borders also and works in. It's how we organize the electric grid the banking system, the food system. Four bridges go out into Mississippi, New York, as hungry in a matter of 48 hours. The electric grid in the, uh, uh, I believe it was the intelligence report, uh, National Intelligence Assessment in 07, said that the electric grid will go down. It isn't a matter of whether it goes down, it's when it goes down. And when it goes down, it will not come back quick. Now think about that. When that goes down, you've got to match for reasons that smart people understand better than I do. You've got to match supply and demand and electrical system, and if it's, gone, if it's taken out in a way that it's taken out permanently, then we're in big trouble. You can't make a credit card purchase. You can't turn on an air conditioner. You can't pump gas. All that requires electricity. So everything that has an on-off switch is out. And uh, when uh, they came to, I uh, brought one of the Pentagon people out to uh, talk to our city council. He told the city council, when this happens, and they know it's being hacked, they know it's being plotted, and when they take large parts of the country dark, it'll stay dark for a long time. He said his words to the city council were, this will launch us back to the 13th century. Now, why not the 14th century or my favorite, the 15th century? I don't know. But things will go dark, and when that happens, this country is in serious trouble. So the, the concern here is about resilience and about national security. There's also a different way to think about security, a bigger way to think about it. It's secure access to health care, to shelter, to food, to livelihood. There's a different way to think about security, and we can, we can be hurt in a lot of different ways. Enemies crossing borders is certainly one way, but doing it to ourselves is certainly another way. The people who I knew growing up near Youngstown, Ohio, those were good, hardworking people. And then they were out of jobs, insecure. And we've got a lot of that in this country. So anyway, this is a security issue. Uh, Joshua Cooper Rama, Rama, who works with uh, uh, Henry Kissinger, said this, we must squarely face the awful fact that our security will become ever more perilous. And that's just one of the hard facts. Unless we can rebuild it from the grassroots, that's what we're trying to do. Second thing we're trying to do is develop a network, and I want to get into this right now, but develop a network in which we start a dialogue, a real dialogue, <coughs> with local communities like Austin and like Oberlin and like Los Angeles and like Denver and small towns everywhere that begin this dialogue of how do we organize our affairs to be fair, resilient, sustainable at the local level with this top-down dialogue of what do we want to be as a country when we grow up. We can't fight uh, wars infinitely. We can't have a defense budget of $1 trillion infinitely. That's bankrupting us. Come with me mentally to Detroit or Youngstown or even parts of Texas, and I'll show you cities beginning to decay, bridges falling apart, people out of work. We can't support infinitely a, a $1 trillion defense budget and war fighting. We've got to start a dialogue about what we want to be when we grow up as a country. And then let me close with a couple of thoughts. This is the uh, opening lines of the uh, U.S. Constitution, 1787. And in this, this is the only place in the Constitution and for a large part in American law where the word posterity appears. We are their posterity. We're eight generations from the people who wrote this, mostly white guys that wrote this document. They mentioned posterity once. Now, posterity has, uh, in, in the Constitution, the word posterity doesn't really appear but the, uh, otherwise, other than here, and the problem that we've got is that posterity has no protection. The Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment say you can't deprive people of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. But what is climate change but a way to deprive people of life and liberty and property with no due process, with no representation? So if you think we're eight generations from that, think of eight generations from here where we are now into the future. That's posterity. And they've got a right to life and liberty and property, and they've got a right to due process. That's our tradition. And then just a little note here. The Founding Fathers, if, you, if you're uh, a believer in what's been called original intention, you have to know, you have to understand that they were, their original intention was to avoid tyranny at all costs. Tyranny for them was King George III. And that was, you know, over in England someplace. 
But tyranny comes in lots of sizes and shapes. And the fact that in our country, 400 people have more net worth, more wealth than the bottom 150 million people. They would have found that unacceptable. That's a different and more pernicious kind of tyranny than King George III. So, black swan events. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, Nicholas Taleb, the Sim Nicholas Taleb, closes out uh, the black swan, the book, with a couple of thoughts. One is, Mother Nature doesn't like re or likes redundancies, but not anything too big or too connected, and think of globalization. And so he says the upshot is to design a society robust to error. Now, this plays to our strong suit. Uh, climate change as a science is hard for us to get our heads, or has been hard for us to get our heads around. Building decent communities plays to our strong suit. We know how to build communities robust to error. A lot of you are doing that here in Austin, Texas. Uh, Plenty Fisk and Gail Vittori are doing that at Max's Pot. Uh, Stephen Moore is doing that at the architectural school. This is happening. We know how to do this. This is not hopeless unless we just don't do it. So um, what's life like in this greenhouse world? Two closing thoughts. Well, it, it's a world, and this is simply my list. You can make a much longer list. It's a world of local foods and farms. That's not bad. Powered by sunshine, we walk and bike more. More local business, regionally appropriate skills, front porches, community. And the word neighbor, not as a noun, but a verb. Fewer shopping malls, less traffic, no wars for oil, no oil-saturated politics. That's almost un-American, you realize. Cleaner air and relearn self-reliance. This is a hopeful world. If you're optimistic, you don't know enough. If you're in despair, that's a sin. But if you're in despair or you're optimistic, you don't have to do anything. You can put your feet up on the... Uh, porch pop the top on another uh, can of beer, and you don't have to do anything. But if you're hopeful, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. You've got to act. If you're hopeful, you've got to engage in making this kind of world possible. This is still possible for us to do. Now, finally, uh, a number of you have read years back uh, a book, a little book, by a guy named Robert Fulgen. All I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. And when people talk about sustainability, what is it? It's like that little girl. Well, we don't know what it looks like until you draw a picture of it, until you make it real. But when you get it down in its essence, it reminds me a lot of Robert Fulgham's rules. Sustainability is about playing fair. Law matters. It's about cleaning up messes, the messes we make in our own time, but messes that we don't pass on to future generations. Uh, it's about sharing things. It's about a society that's big enough and compassionate enough to share its cookies with other people. It's about a society that doesn't take things that aren't ours and taking our kids and their kids and their kids' future. That's not right. And in dangerous times, uh, it's about coming together. It's about holding hands, crossing the street. This is sustainability, and we can do it. We're good at this. Thank you all very much. Questions for Professor Orr? Come to this uh, mic right here on this aisle over here, line up, and have at it. There's clearly nothing worth asking a question about that we heard. Is any of this achievable within con the predatory nature of contemporary corporate capitalism? Uh, is there another question? <laughs> uh, well, uh, Thanks for asking. That. That, that's a good question. And, and if we were to poll uh, all of you in a room, there would be different opinions about it. Um, it. It's the kind of thing on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I think uh, yes. On Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, no way. Uh, Sunday, I don't bother asking the question. Uh, the issue 
is, is how do you develop a set of economic arrangements calibrated with the way the world works physically? And that won't be easy for us to do, and for several reasons. And let me give two basic comments. One is uh, from a Supreme Court decision in 1886. Uh, it was said in that, and this is the uh, Santa Clara County uh, decision, it was said that the, the corporation was protected as a person under the due process uh, clause of the 14th Amendment. In other words, court, you and I are people. We're mortal. You can be at one place at one time. You have assets. Uh, we're ethical. Corporations are abstractions. They can be global. They don't die easily. Uh, they're... they're they have no particular ethical, uh, they're, they're just an abstraction. So in that, in that world, corporations uh, now have assumed a power that no one ever thought they would assume. The word corporation does not appear in the U.S. Constitution. And if you ask how it fits with democracy, uh, one view of this by Yale professor uh, um, Charles Lindblom says they don't fit at all. There's no fit with a corporation in democracy. Uh, the other side of it is this. There's been something interesting happening. A friend of mine, Ray Anderson, and, and many of you in the room, Ray Anderson was the founder of Interface Carpet Corporation. And Ray began to think about the corporation in a different role. Can you have a corporation that functions, that makes money, but it does no harm in the world? And so he, he was making uh, carpet tiles, largest manufactured carpet tiles in the world. And uh, Ray began to rethink his product line. So instead of taking Saudi Arabian crude, product, customer, landfill, he cut off both ends of that and said, let's have a product that we lease to customers and then we take it back and we've made it in a way that we want to get it back. So it's our feedstock. And so as a feedstock, I, I have people, people take the thing apart, reassemble it as carpet and sell it as a new product. Now, that's a whole different way to think about this. And this was pioneered first in, uh, I believe, in Germany. And it was probably, if you make it, you own it forever. So you make it in a way that you want to get it back as a feedstock or for other useful purposes. So Ray was at the cutting edge of capitalism. It's a very different kind of thing. But uh, Ray said before he died of cancer uh, a year or so back, Ray, Ray told me that it's lonely out here being a green capitalist because that's not the rules of the game. And uh, part of the issue is how we govern corporations. So uh, the end of the story for me is we have a corporate-dominated society. And that will be, that will work a lot of mischief unless we govern corporations for public purposes. And this probably means something like rechartering corporations. There are people who know much more about this than I do. But it means uh, going back to an older view of corporations where they're licensed for a limited period of time for a specific purpose that has a public benefit. You follow what I'm saying? Now, the difficulty is, uh, as all of you know, corporations put a lot of money in politics, and it's, it creates a conundrum for us. It's a little bit like I can't climb that mountain because there's a mountain in front of me. How do I get money out of politics? Because they, they basically, uh, as said a long time ago, they, 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 we've got the best Congress money can buy. Uh, and they bought it and sold it. And so now we have to reckon with corporation and corruption. And it's not the old kind of corruption where dollars are get traded for votes. It's a much more uh, subtle kind of corruption than that. But uh, I, thanks for the question. I don't really have a final answer. I think that we'll have to begin to rethink the governance of corporations in ways that uh, we, we just haven't yet uh, taken on. Can you talk a bit about uh, the evolution of employment and uh, job opportunities in what you're working in now, other than finding interesting things for students to do? Are you finding that you've got people who are unemployed finding things to do, learning skills, becoming farmers, whatever it might be? All right, great question. Thanks for asking that. Uh, absolutely. We believe that if we begin to reorient the economy to a local foods economy with uh, solar power and energy efficiency, we believe that we can create in our little economy of Auburn, Ohio, we believe that there are 200 to 300 jobs potentially uh, to be built out there, and there may be more. Uh, what we found is that as the economic development process goes, uh, for example, a uh, film company that had started in New York City was actually fairly successful with a couple of Oberlin graduates, relocated back to Oberlin to make films for little handheld devices, kind of YouTube video types of things. 
and they're doing well financially. Uh, we found that uh, a bike shop moved into town. A uh, wind company set up headquarters in town. A solar company uh, created out of the NASA headquarters moved into town. And so once you start uh, the ball rolling in this direction, people want to be part of that economy. Uh, we've got a, a restauranteur, there's a young uh, former student of mine who wants to start a jazz club in the downtown and mix music in this and make a green jazz club. Now, I don't know what a green jazz club is, but he wants to do it, and I'm not going to stand in his way. But I think the, the employment, uh, and Jane Jacobs' uh, classic book, uh, Life and Death in American Cities, and then another one on the, the economy of cities, talked about import substitution as you begin to buy stuff locally. Now, in our hotel, I hear my, my image of the hotel that we're now planning on is the hotel jump starts a business in local wood production. We still have trees, and why buy tables and chairs and so forth from some catalog made, you know, stuff made someplace else? We can make that locally. Uh, why buy food from California when we can grow it locally? Uh, toiletries for a hotel uh, clientele, we can make those things locally. And so looking at the, the range of things that we can make locally, I think that we can create a good bit of employment that way. But I think your, your question is, uh, is really good. If we don't, I think that we will fail. We've got to create a sustainable economy, an economy that puts everybody back to work again. But well, thanks for that question. Maybe before we take the next question, if you hold on just a second, Nathan, we have a question from the Internet from the Texas Regional Collaboratives in Gainesville, Texas, and uh, Danelle writes, what is the single most important thing we can do as K-12 educators in our classroom? Oh, uh, Danelle, um, I think the single most important thing, and this applies to education everywhere, critical thinking skills, number one. Everybody that graduates from high school, college, or even, even uh, elementary grades ought to have the makings of a good BS detector. Uh, to understand bull when you hear it. Now, that, that's a more complicated thing because you've got to understand enough science to know when you're being, when your leg's being pulled or somebody's just saying something that just can't be true. You've got to have, understand enough history to understand a little bit about how we got where we got. You have to understand sociology and so forth. But at the end of the day, the most important thing, and I, let me say one other thing too, the most important thing is that critical intelligence that understands uh, foolishness when you, when you hear it. And this is an information-loaded age. It is also, in a lot of ways, a foolish age. Um, here's the second thing. I think the... Uh, I don't worry. My, I have a son who is a, an Episcopal priest, and he said, uh, said to me once, Dad, you know, to understand this generation of uh, young people that you teach, you really need to know their music. And so... Uh, he encouraged me to sit down and listen to uh, the, uh, the music of the kids I teach or associated with for an afternoon. It was a long afternoon. <laughs> I was depressed. There is violence, depression. I mean, when you can detect words and melody, I mean, I don't mean to sound like an old fogey, but I am. Uh, but, you, you know, there's a lot of angst out there, and there is a lot of hopelessness out there. And there are, it's harder to grow up now uh, than it was when I was growing up, way back in the 19th century. Uh, uh, there are drugs, there are more temptations, there's more consumption. They're, they're just, it's a more complicated world than it once was. I worry about kids staying indoors too much. What Richard Louv calls in his book, The Last Child in the Woods, uh, attend, or, or nature deficit disorder. I worry about people not being out in the natural world. I worry about the complications and temptations. So for teachers, Daniel, I think giving them a sense of legitimate hope and the, the skills and aptitudes to act faithfully on that hope, to keep dreams alive. And I, I can see hopelessness. I, I don't think that building a solar-powered economy is a particularly difficult task. We, we know how to do that. This isn't a technology issue. So I don't worry about the technology. I worry about the leadership. And I do worry about this generation giving in to hopelessness and despair as problems mount. And they will mount for a while. Uh, so uh, anyway, thanks for that question. That's a very, very good question we all ought to be asking them. Let's take, let's take one more from the Internet. This is from Bert in the Texas Regional Collaborators watching now in uh, Brownsville, Texas. And Bert writes, do you know of other Overland Project partnerships that are underway in the South, particularly Texas and Oklahoma? 
uh, Bert, we're working on uh, on developing those. And if you know uh, cities or even military bases that want to be part of this, let us know. Because the idea is to put together, uh, when this went to people high up in the military, the, the uh, word came back, you've got 10 years. You've got to do this in 10 years, develop a network. And you've got to have one project in every congressional district in the United States. So this, and, and this isn't, I want to point out one thing, this is not conservative, it isn't liberal. It's just practical common sense. It's Americans coming together to rebuild communities and let that be something that has some of the dynamism of the Tea Party movement powered by sunshine and collectiveness and not finger pointing and animosity. Coming together around a, a vision of what a community can be. Uh, so we're open to uh, lots of communities joining in this effort. For the next year or so, we're identifying uh, 10 or 12 that we think will be quick success stories and become models for other uh, communities. But, uh, Bert, if you would send me any, uh, you can get my email address, but send me anything that you, you believe would be useful in developing network in, in southern states, and we're wide open to it. Well, how about one last question from, go ahead, Nate. Hey, um, I was curious, what is the response when you uh, pitch this idea for funding? Do people kind of ever, like, laugh? Do you have to explain the science behind it? Or is it just kind of accepted and things move along? Yeah, Nate, you mean when funders? When, you, when you're uh, trying to pitch this idea to get funding for building a, a new building or so. Oh, you can get any reaction you, you can imagine. Um, I think that, no, no, to be to be totally serious, what's our alternative? If we continue, there, there's not one of you in this room that if you run the film fast forward has good reason to be hopeful or optimistic about the, the future. You just don't have. The, the big numbers are running against us. That's just the science. So what is it we can do to change that? And somebody once said to be hopeful, uh, is not to give in to the odds, it's to try to change the odds, to shift the outcomes. And so I think what most of what I find, there are, there are some exceptions, but most of what I find is agreement because this fits what we're about as a people. A, it is hopeful, not optimistic totally, but it is hopeful that we can change our destiny, we can do something about this that we can bring in different technology, that we can rebuild education, we can equip a generation to help shift this. We were told by Tom Brokaw that the greatest generation was uh, World War II. Well, they were pretty good. Uh, my parents were part of that. But I think that the greatest generation is yet to be uh, seen. That'll be in the future. And I think, you know, what, what's, what's the competing vision? You can't power this country by fossil fuels much longer without frying the planet. But we have the technology and the know-how to begin to shift to solar and to wind and so forth. We know how to do that. And, and I've got to put a big plug in for efficiency. Efficiency can eliminate half our energy consumption at virtually no net cost. And we know how to do that as well. We know how to come together in hard times. The problem is we just haven't perceived that we've got hard times coming at us. There's a famous cartoon um, that had uh, Walt Kelly, who uh, had a cartoon uh, strip for many years. And the feature, the, the, one of the characters in the cartoon strip is a possum. And the possum is in the Okefenokee Swamp, and he's, he's thinking about the environmental crisis. And his conclusion was, he said, we met the enemy, and it's us. And this makes it a really difficult thing. There are no good guys or bad guys. Nobody in this room is a good guy or bad guy. All of us have a carbon footprint. And the question now is, now we have to get off carbon, and the bridge here is efficiency, and then a whole different range of fuels, biofuels and solar and wind and all the other things that we know how to do. But I think that to answer your question just very briefly, uh, I think the reaction is extraordinarily good. And I'll say one, one last thing. Among people who are, uh, say, members of the Tea Party, if, if we start a project that has a lot of specificity. I've got a group that's starting to work on a green school, and there's one Tea Party member that's a very prominent part of that. The idea of starting on something that is practical, where their kids and grandkids are going to be educated, all of a sudden the ideology disappears. And so the more practical and near-term the objective ideology tends to evaporate. 
if you extend the horizon out 50 years, nobody wants to live in a decayed community and have bad air and a collapsed economy and, you know, temperatures are five degrees hotter than they used to be, and nobody wants that future as well. So ideology disappears out there. It disappears here. Ideology that is separating us tends to predominate in that middle ground in between where it's just too abstract. And we can fight about things that aren't really real. And we can, get, we can seize on our ideologies and so forth. So just to get down to work, and this reminds me of one last comment. E.F. Schumacher, who was uh, author of a, a classic little book called Small is Beautiful Economics as if People Mattered. And I recommend read that. Uh, it's still in print, 1972 uh, issue book. At the end of uh, one of his other books, uh, E.F. Schumacher said, if we ask the question, will humankind survive? And the answer comes back, no. Then we're in despair, it's eat, drink, and be merry. If the answer comes back, yes, of course, then we get complacent and we don't do the things necessary to make it happen. And his advice was simply, don't ask the question, get down to work where you are, do the things right in front of you. And I think that's really good advice. That means do the things that are right in front of you and don't ask whether you're going to survive or not. There's no good answer that can be given to that. And I think that the, the answer here for this country at this point is to do the things that we know how to do. Roll up our sleeves and get at this because time is not our friend on this. Make no mistake about it. The numbers are running against us. We have to now begin to transform this country. And the good news is it has already begun. We're well into this. There are lots of people in this room that have worked their whole lives beginning to move this country along. Now we need to take it to scale. And now we eventually need to take it into politics so that nobody, nobody can run for public office as an ecological numbskull. They have to know some things. Nobody can run for office that denies basic science. Nobody can take us back before the Enlightenment and says we're going to live in a world of superstition and fear. We cannot go there. And so we've now got to take this thing to scale, but it will have to become political. This is a political year. And some candidates that are running for office ought to be embarrassed by how little they know. We ought to be embarrassed for them. But they need to be retired. And if they got their degree from Oberlin, or from University of Texas, we ought to rescind their college degrees. Quite a, quite a thought to end on. I'm sure David would be happy to stick around and answer a few questions and talk with you guys. But first, uh, let's let people who need to leave have a chance to leave. But before we do that, why don't we thank David for a remarkably hopeful talk.